that we are greatly underestimating the threat to this country. And I think the day after we celebrated the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we should be reminded exactly what is at stake if a foreign terrorist gets a nuclear weapon into this country. We have failed for a decade to deal with North Korea. We have failed for a decade to deal with Iran. Uh, the developments in Egypt and Turkey are much more dangerous than anybody is looking at in this country. And I think we need, frankly, to ask uh, for a very serious uh, national dialogue. I'd like to see both the House and Senate right now holding hearings on three levels of security. What do you do in Mexico, where there's a civil war underway next door to us? What do you do in the Middle East, where we have totally underestimated the scale of the threat? And what do you do about our national domestic industrial base, which is crucial if we're going to be competitive with China? All three of those are a major threat to us. Congressman Paul. First thing I would like to do is make sure that you understand there's a difference between military spending and defense spending. I'm tired of all the militarism that we are involved in, and we're wasting this money and getting us involved. And I agree, we are still in danger, but most of the danger comes by our lack of wisdom on how we run our foreign policy. So I would say there's a lot of room to cut on the military, but not on the defense. You can slash the military spending. We don't need to be building airplanes that were used in World War II. We're always fighting the last war. But we're under great threat because we occupy so many countries. We're in 130 countries. We have 900 bases around the world. We're going broke. The purpose of Al-Qaeda was to attack us, invite us over there where they can target us. And they have been doing it. They have more attacks against us and the American interests per month than occurred in all the years before 9-11. But we're there occupying their land. And if we think that we can do that and not have retaliation, we're kidding ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves. What would we do if another country, say China, did to us what we do to all those countries over there? So I would say a policy, a national, a foreign policy that takes care of our national defense, that it, we're willing to get along with people and trade with people as the founders advised. There's no authority in the Constitution to be the policeman of the world and no nation building. Just remember, George Bush won the presidency on that platform in the year 2000. And I still think it's a good platform. All right, let me let Senator Santorum respond because I know you strongly disagree. On your, on your website on 9-11, you had a blog post that, said, that basically blamed the United States for 9-11. On your website yesterday, you said that it was our actions that brought about the actions of 9-11. Now, Congressman Paul, that is irresponsible. A president of the United States running for, uh, someone who's running for the president of the United States and the Republican Party should not be parroting what Osama bin Laden said on 9-11. We should have, we, we, are, we, are not being, we are not being attacked, and we were not attacked because of our actions. We were attacked, as Newt talked about, because we have, a, we have a, a civilization that is antithetical to the civilization of the jihadist. And they want to kill us because of who we are and what we stand for. And we stand for American exceptionalism. We stand for freedom and opportunity for everybody around the world. And I am not ashamed to do that. 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Paul. As long as this country follows that idea, we're going to be under a lot of, a lot of danger. This whole idea that the whole Muslim world is responsible for this and they're attacking us because we're free and prosperous, that is just not true. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda have been explicit. They have been explicit and they wrote and said that we attacked we attacked America because you had bases on our holy land in Saudi Arabia. You do not give Palestinians a fair treatment and you have been bombing I didn't say that. I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand what the motive was behind the bombing. At the same time, we had been bombing and killing hundreds of thousands of Iraqis for 10 years. Would you be annoyed? If you're not annoyed, you, then there's some problem. All right, we're going to stay on this subject. We have a question from the audience. Go ahead. Please, please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Sahar Hikmati. I was brought here by Ronald Reagan. I am from Afghanistan, and my question to you is, as the next President of the United States, 
What will you do to secure safety and protection for the women and the children of Afghanistan from the radicals? Governor Huntsman. We are, we are 10 years in, into this war, uh, Sohar. Uh, America has given its all in Afghanistan. We have families who have given the ultimate sacrifice, and it's to them that we offer a heartfelt salute and a deep sense of gratitude. But the time has come for us to get out of Afghanistan. We don't need 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, nation building at a time when this nation needs to be built. We are of no value to the rest of the world if our core is crumbling, which it is in this country. I like those days when Ronald Reagan, you talked about, when Ronald Reagan would ensure that the light of this country would shine brightly for liberty, democracy, human rights, and free markets. We're not shining like we used to shine. We need to shine again. And I'm here to tell you, Sahar, when we start shining again, it's going to help the women of Afghanistan, along with any other NGO work that can be done there and the collaborative efforts of great uh, volunteer efforts here in the United States. We can get it done, but we have to make sure that the Afghan people increasingly take responsibility for their security going forward. Very quickly to, to uh, Governor Perry, $2 billion a week, is that money well spent that by U.S. taxpayers in Afghanistan? Well, I agree with uh, Governor Huntsman when we talk about it's time to bring our young men and women home as soon and, as, and, and, and obviously safely as we can. But it's also really important for us to continue to have a presence there. And I think the entire conversation about how do we deliver our aid to those countries, and is it best spent with... 100,000 military who have the target on their back in Afghanistan? I don't think so at this particular point in time. I think the best way for us to be able to impact that country is to make a transition to where that country's military is going to be taking care of their people, bring our young men and women home, and continue to help them build the infrastructure that they need, whether it's schools for young women like yourself or otherwise. Thank you, Governor. Uh, all right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, Here's what we're going to do. You're going to get to know these candidates a little bit better. When we come back, what would they add to the White House if they were to move in? We'll be right back. Republican presidential candidates on the stage. You know, Americans are looking at you. They also want to know a little bit more about you. I'm going to start with Senator Sant Santorum. I want to go down and get your thoughts uh, on something you would bring to the White House if you were the next president of the United States. An example, President George H.W. Bush put in a horseshoe pit. <laughs> president Clinton put in a jogging track. President Obama added a vegetable garden. Senator Santorum, if you're president, what would you bring to the White House? Well, mine's pretty obvious. Karen and I have seven children, so we'd add a bedroom uh, for, uh, <laughs> or, and some beds uh, to the White House. Speaker Gingrich. Well, first of all, I would reduce the White House by kicking out all of the White House czars the first day, creating a lot more space. Um, and then, because of Callista's interest, we'd have a lot more music. Because of my granddaughter Maggie, we'd have ballet. And because of my grandson Robert, we'd have a very large chess set. So it would all come together. Congressman Paul. I'd bring a bushel basket full of common sense. And I would also bring a course in Austrian economics to teach the people <laughs> the business cycle and why the Fed creates inflation and depressions and all our unemployment problems. Governor Perry. It's simple. I'm going to bring the most beautiful, most thoughtful, incredible first lady that this country's ever seen, Anita. Governor Romney. You know, one of my, uh, one of my heroes uh, was a man who uh, had an extraordinary turn of phrase. Uh, he, he once said about us, he said, you know, you can count on the Americans to get things right after they've exhausted all the alternatives. And uh, now and then we've made a couple of mistakes. We're qu quite, a, quite a nation. And this man, Winston Churchill, used to have his bust in the Oval Office. And if I'm president of the United States, it'll be there again. Congressman Bachman. I would bring a copy of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights, and that's it. 
Mr. Kane. I would bring a sense of humor to the White House because America is too uptight. <laughs> and Governor Huntsman. Uh, and, and to play into that theme, my wife's going to kill me for saying this, but I would bring my, as a 40-year motorcycle rider, I would bring my Harley Davidson and my motocross bike. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the eight Republican presidential candidates. I've had worse. And that's all the time we have. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a hand to our candidates for the Republican nomination for President of the United States. We want to thank our partners, the Tea Party Express, and 150 Tea Party groups from around the country. Thanks also to our host, the Florida State Fairgrounds. Our next debate here on CNN in Las Vegas, October 18th, with the Western Republican Leadership Conference. We look forward to seeing the candidates and all of you there. The conversation continues online right now on Twitter, Facebook, and CNNPolitics.com. More coverage of this debate with Anderson Cooper 360 right now. And Wolf, good evening, uh, everyone. Wolf, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to a special edition of AC360. The CNN Tea Party Republican debate is just wrapped up in Tampa, Florida. Eight GOP hopefuls facing off on jobs, immigration, health care. It got contentious early on with two perceived frontrunners, Mitt Romney and Rick Perry, facing off on Social Security. Let's get right to us. Joining us live tonight, the Situation Room's Wolf Blitzer, who's moderated tonight's debate, John King, host of John King USA, CNN Chief Political Analyst Gloria Borger, CNN Senior Political Analyst David Gergen, CNN Contributor Eric Erickson, Editor-in-Chief of RedState.com, CNN Political Contributor Paul Begala, Ari Fleischer, former White House Press Secretary for President George W. Bush, and CNN Political Analyst Roland Martin. Uh, Wolf Blitzer, in your opinion, was there a clear winner tonight? Anderson, hi. Uh, I'm over here. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, it's a little exciting here on the uh, stage right now. You know what? We're going to let the uh, the folks out there think, uh, decide if there were winners or losers. I was I was pleased because I thought we got to some really substantive issues. We got to some uh, some real disagreements by these candidates, and I think folks emerged from this debate a little bit more knowledgeable about these eight candidates than they did going in to the debate. So by and large, I was pleased with what we heard, and uh, and, and and I was pleased with the. Uh, the opportunity we gave these candidates and through through CNN the American public to have a better appreciation of these eight Republican candidates one of whom uh, almost certainly is going to be the uh, Republican right. nominee and one of whom might even be the president of the United States Anderson uh, John King uh, in your opinion uh, the, the, some of the key moments tonight or a clear winner I saw well, Anderson let me start with this I think one of the key dynamics tonight was Republican Congressman Michelle Bachman had what many in the party thought would had to be a make or break night our June debate, remember, she skyrocketed in popularity and fundraising. She's dropped a bit in the polls of late, in large part because of Governor Perry's entrance into the race. The Congresswoman is with me, and Congresswoman, uh, flat out tonight, you seemed more aggressive, uh, and you seemed wanting every opportunity you could have to strip away some of Governor Perry's record that you think is not consistent with especially Tea Party conservatism. Is that fair? Well, what I have lo would have loved is an opportunity to answer every question that came out tonight, because every question was a good, worthwhile question. And of course, there's limited time, and I would have loved to have answered everyone. But it was a great forum tonight. And to be here with the Tea Party was like being at home. So it was a but, wonderful but Let's come back to the point, though. You said, especially the HPV vaccination yes. issue in Texas, violated liberty? Yes, of course it violates liberty when you have innocent little 12-year-old girls that are being forced to have a government injection into their body. This is a liberty interest that violates the most deepest personal part of a little child. And it also violates the parental rights because what we understand is, again, this was an executive order that mandated that every little 12-year-old girl had to have this vaccination, and then you'd have to opt out. Well. Parents don't necessarily um, have the backing, have the, have the information, the backing to know to opt out. This should be an opt-in. And this is a, clearly an example of overreach from government. And again, the governor admitted that this was a big mistake. But the problem is, again, a little girl doesn't get a do-over. Once they have that vaccination in their body, once it causes its damage, that little girl doesn't have a chance to go back. And so you can't just say you're sorry. When you're president of the United States, you don't get a mulligan. 
You don't get a do-over. You've got to get it right the first time. And I have a core sense of conviction about these issues.